Alison. Hi, Sarah. Let's kick off this week with some good news ah, for a change. For a change, yeah. yeah. Okay. French journalist Olivier Dubois was released this week mm. after being held by jihadists in northern Mali for nearly two years. Yeah, an American aid worker, Jeffrey Woodkey, who had been held since October 2016, was also freed. The government of Niger played a big role in securing their release, and both of them traveled on the same plane to Niamey Airport. Dubois was France's last remaining hostage. Ah. Yeah, good news. Huh? Yeah. Uh, he got back into Paris on Tuesday, he looked rather tired, but he was obviously very happy. Uh, his family was there to greet him, so was French President Emmanuel Macron. Mm -hmm. Dubois was kidnapped on the 8th of April 2021 by Akim, that's a jihadist group in Maghreb affiliated with Al-Qaeda. He told RFI's David Bache that he had not been mistreated, he hadn't been hit or humiliated during captivity, but he had been held as a prisoner in northern Mali, along with another hostage from South Africa. He said he realised very quickly that if he wasn't to go completely mad, he had to keep himself occupied. C'était mon deuxième ou troisième jour à passer euh, allongé sous une natte. After two or three days lying down on a cloth next to the Mujahideen, they're sleeping or drinking tea and you're doing nothing, I said to myself, Olivier, if this goes on for long, it'll wreck you physically and, above all, mentally. You've got to keep yourself occupied. I worked out a program and it really helped. So, physical activities, but also reading. I asked to be allowed to read the Quran to see what it contained, to try and understand the book and why it's important for them. It helped me to understand them a bit better and to have conversations with them. They were open to that. We were able to debate. And then there was the cooking. I couldn't stand the food they were serving up, so I asked if we could have a pot to make our own. I also cut wood to build a shelter. Basically, you have to stay busy, give yourself challenges and get a sense of satisfaction through that. What also helped Dubois mentally was being allowed to listen to the radio, ah. Sarah, yeah, and RFI in particular. Now, although Mali's interim government cut off RFI broadcasts in March 2022, Dubois was able to listen on shortwave religiously three times every day. And especially on the 8th of every month, when RFI broadcast messages from his family, his friends and his support group. That's how he knew that his son had lost his first tooth huh. and how his wife had never stopped battling to keep him in the public eye. There's the power of broadcast radio, I guess. It is. RFI, Radio France Internationale. Meanwhile, it's been a tumultuous week in French politics and it's not over. Sur le fondement de l'article 49 alinéa 3 de la Constitution, j'engage la responsabilité de mon gouvernement. France's National Assembly was literally electric last Thursday, as you can hear, mm -hmm. when Prime Minister Elisabeth Bonn announced that the government was triggering the so-called Article 49.3 of the Constitution to be able to push through its contested pension reform without a final vote in Parliament. She could barely make herself heard in the National Assembly, this over the heckling mm. by opposition MPs, most of them from the hard left, and then they started singing the Marseillaise. Up until the last minute, everyone thought that the government would allow the bill to be put to a vote because... Well, it's such a huge and sensitive issue that, yeah. they, you know, they should have gone through the normal procedure. Exactly. The bill is intended to reform the pension system. It would extend the minimum age of retirement from 62 to 64 years old and lengthen the amount of contributions we have to pay into the system. The government says we need this to make up for what will be a major deficit in the next decade. But those who are opposed say this reform is unfair. It makes it even harder for people who started work early in life or, or those who have low paid manual jobs. There have been weeks, literally, of strike action, rallies, blockages at refineries, incineration plants as well. That's why we've got tons of uncollected rubbish on the streets of Paris. Yeah, yeah. Photos of that have pretty much gone viral mm. around the world. Uh, 
Um, but in the end, despite all of this, President Emmanuel Macron opted for the use of the 49.3, which is often referred to as a legislative nuclear weapon. Mm-hmm. The parliament immediately tabled two votes of no confidence, but they both failed. One of them, though, by just nine votes. Yeah. So the bill is passed, though it has not yet been enacted. The majority of the French are still opposed to the reform. And now, given the way that's been forced through, some of them are even more angry. Yeah, yeah. And there have been spontaneous protests on the streets of Paris and other big cities every night now for a week. This has been compared, of course, to the very organized union protests that we've had since January. Um, there have been some very violent clashes with police, and it's all been coming very difficult to control. Yeah. In a televised interview on Wednesday, so yesterday, Macron said he had no regrets about the way that the reform was passed, except maybe, well, yeah, it could have been explained a bit more. But he insisted that this was an absolute necessity to keep the system in the black so that France wouldn't have to cut funding from other areas. Mm. He also said that the crowd or the mob, if you like, didn't have the legitimacy of people who had voted for elected representatives. Right. So pitting, I guess, the street against Mm. parliamentary institutions. As you can imagine, that hasn't done much to calm things down. Mm -hmm. Macron's opponents, whether they're opposition MPs, the unions or people out protesting, they are continuing to say that the way it's been pushed through via Article 49.3 is a denial of democracy. Well, is it? Mm. I asked Christophe Boutin. He's a political scientist and specialist on constitutional law at Caen University. No, it isn't undemocratic, he told me, but you can see why there's a problem. Using the 49.3, that's to say asking for a vote of confidence or no confidence, is perfectly legal and perfectly constitutional. Since 1958, we had 149.3 and many of them without any trouble. You have to understand that in 1958, when we built the new constitution, the problem was the excessive power of parliament, of MPs against the government. And to build majorities, the vote of no confidence became a solution and a democratic solution. But in this case, and it is the problem, it's difficult to find a solution. It could be uh, some difference of legitimacy between MPs and the street. And the president is surfing in this way. Before this 49.3, we already had another article, 47.1, which allowed Parliament to push through the pension reform debate much quicker than it would have done for a normal bill. So... To an extent, people are feeling, hang on a minute, we didn't really get a chance to discuss this. Exactly. Using the 47.1 is at least as problematic as the using of the 49.3. Because uh, people think that we are not really discussing the text as MPs. Uh, When we have a doubt between the MPs' legitimacy and the street, we have other solutions in the Constitution. We can use a referendum and ask directly the people what he wants. And we can make a dissolution of the National Assembly and have a new vote, seeing if the same majority came in the chamber. But uh, these ways are not going to be used by Emmanuel Macron. He said very clearly, didn't he? No referendum, no dissolution of parliament and no reshuffle. So it's very hard to imagine how these, these protests are, are going to be calmed down. Exactly. Things seem to be blocked. We have no solution between the syndicates and the government. Emmanuel Macron spoke on Wednesday and uh, he said that he wants to create a new uh, debate between the syndicates and the government. But actually, it is impossible to have the basis of a new debate. Yeah, you talk about the syndicates, so, you know, the unions, which have been quite excluded, uh, and that in itself is an issue. Now, at the moment, then, the Constitutional Council are looking at the pension reform law. They're going to be looking at things like whether there can be a referendum on the law, but also whether all the articles do respect the Constitution. How likely is it that the Council could reject it? Well, uh, we have effectively... Two problems. Uh, first, we have to note that it's not usual to see not only the MPs of the opposition, but also the Prime Minister called on the Constitutional Council. 
Elizabeth Bourne wants to prove that there's nothing in the text or nothing in the methods used to vote the text which could be unconstitutional. A uh, problem is not the using of the uh, 49.3, but uh, as you said before, the using of the 47.1, because it is concerning social security. And does every part of the text concern it? This is a question for the Constitutional Council, and I don't think that he will reject all the law, but he probably will reject parts of it. And there is also another problem, the referendum. The MPs wanted to make a referendum, what we called a linked referendum, in French, a referendum d'initiative partagée, coming from the MPs and with the support of the people. And therefore, you have to uh, be uh, approved by the Constitutional Council. So is this a very specific kind of referendum then that the Constitutional Council will be looking at? Yes, the initiative here came from the MPs yes. and not from the people. If the Council say yes, you need to have 4 million 700,000 people. 4.7 million voters supporting the referendum, is that right? Yes, and okay. it's, uh, we never have such a referendum. And uh, I don't think it could be possible. President Macron is definitely digging in his heels and saying this will happen. To what extent is France going through a major political crisis? It's a major political crisis because uh, you have weakness of the government majority at the parliament. And Emmanuel Macron on Wednesday say that he wants the prime minister, Elisabeth Borne, to uh, increase this majority. But uh, we don't know how it could happen. The second problem is the crisis in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very big crisis, actually, like in 1995, or uh, like uh, the revolt uh, that we called Gilets Jaunes, uh, Yellow Jackets, in 2018-2019. Uh, could we see a resurgence of the Yellow Vest protest movement? Well, Emmanuel Macron, he make a distinction between uh, the good people accepting the reform and the bad crowd who was yeah. against the reform. I don't think that's really a, a good thing to... to Oppose to, people uh, like that. Yes, yes. But uh, he is going to do it. And uh, people actually uh, don't want to have violence in the street. So uh, Emmanuel Macron is um, trying to say that we need Republican order and uh, Republican order is final to uh, accept the reform. Let's talk about names. Um, for a long time, France was very particular about the names you can give your children. And this was because of Napoleon. Oh, him again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't escape him. Can Can't we? escape him. No. On April the 1st, 1803, so 220 years ago this week, when Napoleon was in charge of France, though before he was emperor, he passed a law that required children to be given first names from religious calendars or to be named after prominent historical figures. He made the decision in order to put a stop to a slew of political revolutionary names that had appeared after the 1789 revolution. Hmm, so like what? Well, you had Liberté being <laughs> named, um, one named Victorine Constitution. Um, you even had kids named Révolution. None of this really to Napoleon's taste. Yeah, they are maybe difficult names to carry, but <laughs> clearly he was making a political stance, right? Sure, sure. Um, the law stuck around for over 150 years until the 1960s. After the Second World War, France saw a wave of immigration and also a growth of regional identity. A first modification came in 1966 under Charles de Gaulle. Um, it still kept the concept of, of naming kids French names, mm -hmm. but it did allow foreigners some leeway and also allowed in certain Muslim names. Hmm. So I imagine this is when some of these Breton names came into use, like yeah. Erwan, Maël, Nolwen. Exactly. <laughs> um, I actually have personal experience with this. Well, I mean, my father does. 
because when he went to register um, my, me when I was born, um, one of my middle names is Ivani. Ivani. Mm, it's nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a made-up name. I, I won't get into the story. Okay. Here. <laughs> but he, but he told the um, when he told it to the person at City Hall, they said nah, it's not really a French name, but it's okay. You're a foreigner. We'll oh. allow you as an American. We'll allow you to get, name your kid that. So there oh, you it's, go. It's nice to hear sometimes that being foreign can occasionally weigh in your favor. There you go. Yep. Yeah, occasionally. Um, the rules around what you could name a child didn't actually fully disappear until 1993. Now the law says only that a name must be in the interest of the child. So no offensive or ridiculous names, though that, of course, is subjective. You can challenge a decision in court. Yeah, I remember a story that made the news a few years ago. Parents who'd named their child Nutella, mm -hmm. the chocolate spread, yeah. uh, they were told to rename her. Yeah, and, and I think I would back that decision. You think you, <laughs> you wouldn't name your kid Nutella? Mm, chocolate I'm spread? not a big fan. <laughs> no, sorry, no. sorry. Um, in 2018, a mother was ordered by a family court to change her kid's name from Jihad, which is the Arabic word for struggle, mm. and actually not an uncommon name, but, you know, these days has different connotations. She had to change it to Jihad. Jahid. Yeah, I guess given the French context mm -hmm. with, the, you know, the attacks by Islamist extremists, it, it could be in the interests of the child not to have that name. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, Napoleon's 1803 law came back into the spotlight with Eric Zemmour. Remember him? I sure do. <laughs> the far right, xenophobic political pundit and one time failed presidential candidate. Indeed. So for years, Zemmour has insisted on the need for French names. Calling your child Mohammed is colonizing France, he said. Um, strong mm -hmm. words. He mm -hmm. got sued for racism after a TV appearance in 2018 where he told a guest, her name was Hapsatu C. He told her she should change her first name to Corinne, mm -hmm. um, amongst other things he said there. Zemmour has called for Napoleon's 1803 law to be reinstated, to have children given Christian names, mm. he says. Um, but he actually got it wrong. The law doesn't specifically, or didn't specifically talk about Christian names. It referred to calendar names. Um, you could argue that that concept implied a Christian calendar. But um, also opening names up to historical figures meant that, for example, the French president, who was born in 1837, Sadi Carnot, he was named legally Sadi after a Persian poet. Hmm. So what is in the name? A lot, it would seem. Sure, yeah. And interestingly, when you look at the top names in France, though, the INSEE Statistics Institute lists them. They remain actually pretty classic. In 2021, the top girl's name was Jade, Jade, um, kind of an outlier. That one was probably not acceptable to Napoleon. But you have Louise, Emma, and for boys, it's Gabrielle, Leo, Louis. So pretty classic. Hmm. Napoleon's legacy lives on. Yeah, but no Josephine. No Josephine. <laughs> A major UN report this week dubbed a survival guide for humanity said the Earth would reach 1.5 degrees of warming, that famed level, by the early 2030s unless we cut emissions across the board. So a major warning yeah. there. Yeah, a bit of a downer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Adding to the, well, already depressing news of, you know, the, the lack of rain, uh, winter droughts, glaciers melting at a, an unstop a seemingly unstoppable yeah. pace. It, I don't know, sometimes it's tempting maybe to want to throw up your hands and, and, and give up. Yeah, but that's what Dorothy Moisan wanted to do when she quit her longtime job as a journalist for the AFP news agency a few years ago to focus on the environment. She'd had an aha moment where she realized that this was the issue she wanted to focus on. She actually went back to school to study climate change. But after a few months, she got really, really down. I mean, mm -hmm. learning about the science and how things are going from bad to worse, it really made her very depressed. Yeah, and now there's a term for this, isn't there? Mm. Eco-anxiety. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I suffer from that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, I do too, I think. Like, I think we all do if you're sort of yeah, looking at it's things. it's difficult. Um, so Dorothy was overwhelmed. Um, she felt powerless, but she also realized, you know, she couldn't turn back. She had to continue doing this work. She saw that some people were not giving in to their eco-anxiety and decided to go talk to them to see how they did it. And she wrote a book called The Ecoptimis, a term that she coined, eco-optimis, and she profiled nine people. 
at that point, I thought to myself, because I was really low at that moment, if I want to be able to survive, I really have got to do something. That's at this moment that I decided I'm going to identify some people who managed to do what I'm not. These people that I call the ecoptimists, people were conscious, like me, about the ecological crisis, but who were able to overtake their eco-anxiety and to uh, go forward. So then you went and looked for these people. Um, were you looking in France? Were you looking all over the world? That was a question. Uh, there are two, two things. I wanted a small book that people could read so quickly and so easily just to give them uh, a boost, really something efficient. And so it could be so many people. I didn't want so many people. I wanted to make uh, the portrait because I thought it was really the example which was really inspiring, to make people feel like, wow, this guy, this woman, they're so fantastic. I, I feel like her, and I want to act as she does, and I will feel better, and I will manage to go forward mm -hmm. and to become myself an optimist. So I decided to follow only French people, or at least French-speaking people, because they're a Swiss guy, because I wanted the reader to be able to identify with uh, this ecoptimist. And if I was taking a young um, Senegalese girl or a Chinese guy or an American climate activist, I thought French-speaking people wouldn't be able just to identify with these people. Because it's, it's important to really have sort of a personal connection with this kind of thing. Yes, because it's all emotional. So, I mean, if, if you want to be able to, to help, you've got to really find this connection with uh, your reader. So you're looking for French people or French-speaking people. Was it, was it difficult? I think the problem wasn't that they were French or not. It was just to find them. At the beginning, I was like, whoa, who am I going to find and to interview? It's the way I'm, I started, which is quite important for me, because I was just talking to a, fr um, a French scientist. He's called Franck, Franck Courchamp. He's a biologist and ecologist. Uh, I was interviewing him for about like uh, the loss of biodiversity and uh, these extinctions, not really funny things. And I talked to him about my project, And I was like, by the way, Frank, do you get uh, some fun sometimes? Well, yes, 95% of the time. But you just like handle every day with this so tragic news. How do you do? And I knew at that very moment I found my first specimen. I would say that the main thing for Frank is teaching. Teaching what he knows to younger people and bringing them to the knowledge and to the action is something really important to him. I mean... You've got many, each ecoptimist has got many tricks and many uh, ways of overtaking the anxiety. But for Frank, I would say it would be, uh, I guess, transmission and um, making science uh, accessible uh, to empower people. You seem to have had then this moment of, through this project, at least going from being eco-anxious to eco-optimist. Would you say that you're eco-optimist now after all this? I would say I'm, um, in French, is eco-optimist en devenir. I guess in English would be an eco-optimist in progress. Now I'm, I'm, um, I'm comfortable with the fact or with the idea that I could become an eco-optimist, a 100% eco-optimist. But something that I realized while working on that project was that You don't need to be a optimist 100% of the time. You can have some ups and downs. Uh, for example, Guillermo Fernandez, who is a, a father of three, when he, after having read the IPCC report, he just got depressed. And within a few hours, he decided he had to react because uh, the future of his children uh, was at stake. And so he decided he would make this anger strike uh, till the Swiss parliamentarians decide to get some information about climate, what he obtained after 39 days of anger strike. And this guy, he had become a optimist because he saw action and becoming um, an activist was something which was giving joy. But for two months, I lost trace of him. And finally, he called me back after two months. And he told me, no, but, you know, I was, like, really depressed. Because after all this buzz about uh, this uh, anger strike and stuff, I was so happy, and suddenly it was difficult just to handle with it. And I thought to myself, is he an optimist? Has he got still his place in this project? And I said, yes, of course. Because I'm an optimist. You've got uh, the title of a book in French, which is, you can fall seven times. The impotent is to get up eight times. And so I really realized it was the case. An optimist is this person who will manage to get up again with this joy and this strength, but it won't be all the time so joyful. Why? Because when you know about what's happening on Earth, you can't be joyful every day. It sounds like that everybody then, it's, it's a process. You're not just, I'm optimistic or I'm not optimistic. You have to work at being eco-optimist, eco-optimist. Yeah, I, th I think you've got to do, to, to do that. And that's what uh, this eco-optimist gave me, like tricks, uh, for example, from Anne, a 58-year-old. She worked in a fast food company. And after 
15 years in this company, she, she, she decided to go and work for uh, La Fondation Nicolas Hulot, right. an environmental organization. Environmental NGO, exactly. And she created her, her own company, a consultancy about uh, transition. She often tells me, on fait grandir ce que l'on regarde. You make grow what you are looking at. So, of course, if I just, I'm focused every morning on the radio announcing me all this bad news about like uh, the fact that it, it doesn't rain for so many days or for this pollution or for that or that. How do you want me to be able to be positive? Uh, if you just focus on these bad news, of course, they exist. I mean, it's not the case of erasing them. But if you just focus on that, you get paralyzed. Mm -hmm. You can't act. You can just decide to focus your attention on something else. And it's what you're going to look at which is going to take such an importance for you and will empower you of doing something else. So she says, try to focus on the good news and not the bad news. It's not uh, meaning you shouldn't read the, the newspaper and stuff, but sometimes just like choose to focus your attention on something else. Often when we look at climate change solutions, there, there's always a push and pull between the individual action and the collective action. And people say, well, you know, I should take fewer planes, but really maybe it's the airline industry that needs to change. How do you reconcile that? Because right now we're focusing on individuals to inspire individuals. How does that work in the bigger scheme when really we need sort of society-wide changes? I think we shouldn't oppose uh, these two uh, ways, systemic change and individual change. Of course, we need all changes. I'm a bit upset when I hear these people say it's useless just to act uh, on my own. It's often an excuse not to do anything. And a common point of all the ecoptimists I interviewed is that they don't think it's only the others. They just start by themselves. Of course, they're trying to convince others to be an example for others, to change things. Some of them are able Heidi Sylvestre, for example, she's a glaciologist. Uh, she's trying to convince people at a national, international level. And that's fantastic. But you don't need to go at that uh, level to be useful to the planet or to the humanity. Of course, I mean, I'm a journalist and I know uh, the system's got to change. It's, uh, it's all about capitalism and the fact that we can't go on consuming uh, the resources of the world as we do. It's just not possible. But it starts by, by you, by me, by all these people. We've come to the end of Spotlight on France. We're a production of the English service of Radio France International. This episode was mixed by Cécile Pompiani. And as usual, we would love to hear from you. Yeah. Send, send us an email at spotlight.france at rfi.fr. Au revoir, Victor. Au revoir, Félix. Yeah, we really would love to hear from you. Send us an email. You can also find us on Instagram, Spotlight on France. You can get previous episodes at rfienglish.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll be back in two weeks' time on Thursday, April the 6th. Bye-bye, Sarah. Bye, Alison. Au revoir, Naomi. Cher Louis. Au revoir, papa. Au revoir, Gabriel. Au revoir, Laura. Au revoir, papa. Au revoir, Fantine. Au revoir, Siobhan. Au revoir, Milton. Au revoir. Eh ben, ils sont tous partis. Ouf.